Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to this Connect University event on medical technology advances, nervous system on a chip. My name is Andrea Dumitrescu, and I'm part of the Connect University team. Established in 2015, Connect University is the knowledge sharing flagship initiative of DigiConnect that aims to inform the EU staff and the general public about the latest digital trends. Cutting edge technologies placed high on the political agenda are presented with the scope to foster inspiration, identify current opportunities and threats, while enabling synergies between various EU institutions, industry, academia, and international organizations. The project is a trademark for debates and policy advice, raising awareness about the ongoing digital revolution and preparing the society for the future changes. In this context, Connect University presents the latest innovations from the digital world, together with their impact on our societies and economies, focusing on how we can make best use of the emerging technologies to actually shape our future. Uh, for today's session, those of you who are not yet connected via Slido, we invite you to do so using the code NEURO. I repeat, the code for Slido is NEURO. You can ask us questions and we will allocate them accordingly. Also, we encourage you to use the hashtag ConnectUniversity when sharing insights on the event on social media. The recording of the event will be available as of next week. Uh, the links are also added uh, in, on Slido. However, however, feel free to also visit the Digital EU channel on YouTube uh, at any time where you can find all the Connect University recordings or redirect yourself to the Connect University webpage on Futurium where we have a dedicated space with all the videos and the link is shared already on Slido. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Enrique Claverol, uh, Medical Technology Portfolio Manager at the European Innovation Council and SME Executive Agency, our moderator of today. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, Thank you, everybody, and uh, hello to the audience. My plan is to do a brief 10-minute presentation um, to introduce uh, the talk today by Professor Lutzke. Um, uh, as Andrea was saying, I'm the Program Manager for Medical Technology at the um, European Innovation Council, but the, the project and our efforts in medical technology are actually a, a collaboration between different entities within the Commission, in addition to the EAC, DG Connect, DG RTD, DG Santé, and others. Um, let me briefly describe a little bit what's our pipeline in medical technology at the Innovation Council. So the Innovation Council is this new agency that focuses on delivering technologies to the end user. And of course, in medical technologies, we are talking about delivering technologies to the patient and to the clinic. So we have a structure, a pipeline of support of projects that goes from the left-hand side in this image, which is essentially early stage ideas, and we make them progress through transition and through accelerator phases down to the patient. So the essential goal of the agency is to support R&D, but to do this uh, in a purpose way. So focusing on delivering solutions to patient and to the clinic as soon as possible. Just to give you a brief idea of what we have in the pipeline, we have 349 medical technology research projects. And you could split those in two big groups. You could say, okay, how many do we have early stage? We have about 43% of those, so 149 projects, focusing on very, very tough challenges with high risk approaches, but high return opportunities. And then we also have about 200 projects that are more mature. They are closer to the patient, closer to the clinic. Uh, just to give you a general overview of the size of the effort, we invest about 200 to 300 million euros every year on R&D um, within medical technologies only. The, the agency is wider, up to 1 billion per year, but the medical technologies part is up to 300 million. And let's focus a bit on the, the main topic for today. One of the key object, objectives within the pipeline is, of course, to cure brain-related disorders. This, Nothing to be added, we all know the social impact. So this is at the policy level extremely important. And in particular, if you focus on Parkinson's disease, neurodegenerative cases, this is very obvious. But we don't want to just provide solutions to those diseases, we want to do this fast, get to the patient as fast and as effectively as we can. And in addition to that, we set up a very high bar, a very high threshold for ourselves. We also want to eliminate animal use, 
or at least reduce as much as we can animal use in this process. And here is we have um, where we come to one particular area that again is the key topic for today, and this is brain on chips. It's a very unique, very exciting area. Let me give you a little bit of background. It's just a coincidence. I work in this field for many years. So let me give you a little bit of history, a very interesting history. So back in the 70s and early 80s, we had two people who had a very similar idea working in parallel completely independently. Jerry Pine, who was in the West Coast in California, and then Gunter Ross, who was in Florida, and then he moved to, to Texas. And they both independently came up with one idea. What if we had a small chunks of the brain um, in vitro culture on a small chip so that that little chip could let us see those circuits of neurons, how they operated, uh, because those circuits would be much, much easier than working with the actual brain. We would not use animals or human beings. We have a very small circuit, and we would probably understand that circuit much, much, much faster because it would be very simple. And there was a big coincidence in history because they existed at the time when microelectronics was evolving very quickly. So in 1980 and even early 1977, as you can see there on the screen, they published the first papers demonstrating they could put neurons, live neurons, on a few electrodes and measure what those neurons were doing in those very simple circuits. What you see there is one of the early devices, but uh, interestingly, the technology didn't change for a couple of decades. So in the 80s, they developed these uh, glass substrates using microelectronics technology, and, and they fabricated these electrodes on top of the glass. You can sort of barely see those lines. Those are conductive lines. And this little ring holds the cell culture. So they would put neurons on top of that, of that chip, and they could see electrical signals as those neurons, and you can see an image here of those neurons to the right-hand side, bottom right, um, as those neurons attached and grew circuits, they could record activity. So again, the concept was, if we can build this very simple brain on a chip and measure what the circuit is doing, what this very simple brain is doing, we will understand the circuit faster than we would with real animals. We would find probably molecules that can cure a number of diseases, and third, we will eliminate the need for animals. That was the concept, and the proof of concept happened in the 80s already. Now, let me show you just, show you just one slide about how that evolved. So we fast forward to the future, to 2007. This is work that I did myself in my research lab in Europe when I returned from Jerry's lab. And one of the things we were doing already in 2007, uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, um, we tried to build these chips that had a 3D structure. And the 3D structure helped us grow, grow these cells to imitate the anatomy in the real brain. So here, where you can see the right-hand side, you can see a little neuron that we used to drop manually into micro wells. That neuron would attach to the bottom, and it would grow along these tiny, tiny micro channels. And what we could do is we could create any geometries we like, trying to imitate the brain in vitro. If you remember, initially in the 80s, Jerry and Gunther were just dropping cells. They would organize randomly. Later on, in 2000, early 2000, 2007, my team tried to create geometries that were similar to the brain. And that's one of the big objectives we've always had in this field. One of the advantages of having cells growing along these channels is that you can actually see, you can actually see the signals here on the right-hand side as the information propagates from neuron to neuron along those axons. So we can control the geometry and we can track the information as it propagates. And that's true for a healthy neuron and for a non-healthy neuron in vitro. So we can learn a lot. So let's fast forward to the future. Uh, 2021. Nowadays, you can find companies, you can find this in the market already, where they've gone a uh, larger scale. You can have um, devices with multiple wells, and every well includes several electrodes, and you can put neurons into those wells and record from multiple wells. And that's very important because in pharma, in pharma industry, you have to do screening at larger scale than individual chips. So today, you can find these devices already in the market. So, and I'm finishing here. So what's the challenge? Why do we have these projects in our portfolio, in our pipeline at the EAC? What's missing? It seems like if everything is done. Well, it isn't. The reality is, that we've known for many years, and this is a, a, an image, this is a drawing from Ramonica Hall more than a century ago, 
um, you can see here that the uh, hippocampus, which is involved in memory formation, is a very complicated architecture. There are millions and millions of neurons that must be organized in a specific geometry. And although in my lab and others, we learn how to create some of these geometries in vitro, we never quite replicated a complete area of the brain, which is what you need if you want to really make these brain-on-chip technologies useful for discovery of new therapeutic solutions. So the first big challenge that we still have as a community, as a research community, you see here as number one, increase the similarity with in vivo brain. Unless we have better in vitro models on the chip, we quite not deliver what we expected. Second goal we still have is, this has to be done at scale and at reasonable cost. Otherwise, it cannot be used to find um, compounds that have therapeutic potential, because typically you need to test at least hundreds of thousands of compounds. So you need to have hundreds of thousands of neurons, hundreds of thousands of, of brain and chip platforms. And finally, uh, we need to develop assays that demonstrate that the data delivered by those neurochips can be used for pharmaceutical purposes to deliver new compounds, new solutions. And this is not trivial yet. It hasn't been achieved. So for that reason, it's um, a focus, one of the focuses of our portfolio to solve those solutions as soon as possible and really realize what can be realized with brain energy. And today we will be um, telling you about one of our projects um, and Professor Regina Lutzke will be telling us about Connect. She's the coordinator of the project. She's a professor at Technical University of Eindhoven, and she's a world-renowned expert in material science, engineering, biochemistry, and particularly combining those disciplines in this area, in brain on chip technology. So without further ado, um, Professor Lutzke, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for your attention. Let me... Stop sharing. Done. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think I, I can just move for it, right? So I'll just start sharing my you can share now, yes. presentation. Um, I think this should work. So yes, we'll see the presentation now. Laser pointer if I need it. Right. So uh, once more, thank you very much for the organizers to uh, to have me here in this particular um, special scene online, YouTube, uh, worldwide. So that's a first for me to be, you know, seen worldwide. Uh, once more, my name is Regina Lutka. I'm the chair of Neuro Nanoscale Engineering at uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. And uh, maybe it's it's curious for you to know that we are located at the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And it's very exciting for me to, uh, to, to present this type of work from uh, mechanical engineering department, as maybe uh, you might not think that we would deal with soft matter or with the biological experiments or the medical field in general. But uh, yes, it's very important, of course, to get the mechanics right in this type of devices that Enrica just explained, uh, started development uh, some uh, you know years earlier than 1970s and 1980s. Uh, it's very fascinating. I will not touch too much about the um, uh, the specifics of uh, MEEs, so microelectrode arrays. Thank you very much, Enrique, for giving an introduction on, on what's the state of the art in the microelectrode array development. But of course, we will uh, integrate those devices with our devices. And my speciality is uh, integrating fluidics components within um, within this new uh, area of brain on a chip. But with the Connect project, uh, which is a collaborative project, of course, um, we are going a step further. So we're not just saying brain, which may be complicated enough, we are actually going to emulate what we think is uh, the key of uh, develop new models for the entire body, actually. And, um, starting to connect essential parts of the nervous system, which are very much not only at the base of neurodegenerative diseases, but actually on the base of many types of comorbidity diseases. And so we, we are emulating with the nervous system on a chip, the brain-gut access without involving 
components of the guts, but involving the cellular nervous cells at that brain gut axis. So without further ado on that, um, let me just show and share this particular image with you because I'm still very much uh, in love with that uh, particular image. Uh, it has been actually <laughs> it has been actually achieved um, uh, some years ago now by my PhD uh, student, former PhD student Bart uh, uh, Turing, and uh, it was funded actually by my ERC starting ground project that we could develop new platforms to. Uh, look into opportunities to bring uh, nervous system cells, neurons, into the third dimension. And uh, obviously, everybody was thinking, okay, we need this uh, neural network, and we need a neural network in, in all three dimensions, sparsely distributed. Also, like Enrique, you just showed beautifully that the brain is actually three-dimensionally organized and hierarchically organized in very uh, very specific compartments, which are then highly connected in very specific ways, which we are still far from it to, to emulate that part, of course. But here we thought, okay, we make advantage of uh, well-known silicon micromachine techniques, which are developed for microelectronics, um, uh, from the microelectronics domain. And we make little pits, and we take advantage of the single crystal planes of the silicon, make a pyramidal pit, and then capture a single cell in this pit and have the opportunity to start really pairing a single cell in its three-dimensional shape with an electrode. So that was the conceptual idea, and we are still working on it. And I, 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 I'm, I'm just so fascinated that we were able to uh, capture the cells, actually by a microfluidic action, capture the cells and keep them alive, even though the next cell, so what you're seeing here, you just see one pocket, but there are actually 900 of those uh, pyramidal pockets. And the next neighboring cell is uh, 70 microns away, uh, 70 microns is about the thickness of the hair, just to remind you about the length scale. And of course, the cell is, uh, is about uh, 10 to 20 microns. And uh, this is a, a specific uh, neuronal model cell. It's actually a so-called neuroblastoma cell line cell, an uh, SHSY5Y cell. Uh, not too important how it's called, but uh, uh, it allows us to observe the differentiation processes of those cells within this type of microfabricated environments. Having said that, so of course we want a little bit more than just a single cell, and how do we do that? Uh, let me first uh, introduce um, the project as the project partners. Connect uh, being um, funded by the uh, Fed Project initiative of the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, we have uh, uh, partners um, in uh, several countries, in, uh, in, in of course the Netherlands, our partner uh, Erasmus Medical Center, and then uh, in Luxembourg, uh, University of Luxembourg, and uh, in UK, University of Sheffield, in uh, Belgium, the KU Leuven, as well as in Finland, uh, the Alto University. And uh, every of these partners uh, is renowned for their very specific expertise. And I will come uh, into more details to that uh, later uh, throughout my presentation. I will also touch um, uh, on some of the developments being done at my partner's uh, labs, just to provide a little bit of more context to the field that I'm actually very passionate about, which is micro and nanofabrication methods, specifically for microfluidic parts. So we also are very much supported by a business intelligence company, EFFAN, they help us with the managerial, managerial aspects of the project. And without them, we would be really lost on the innovative uh, uh, structure and strategy, and they really help us to pull uh, the knowledge and the IP together. So uh, thanks to all my partners uh, with that. Of course, thanks to all my uh, collaborators and young scientists for working very hard on this project as PhD students and postdocs. And um, uh, I put this up and saying, okay, stop neurodegenerative diseases, stop Parkinson's disease. Specifically, we uh, uh, aim on Parkinson's disease because uh, one of our partners, actually Luxembourg University, um, Professor Jens Schwammerns group, is a specialist in um, 
creating the brain structure of the midbrain. And the midbrain has a special region, the substantia nigra. And in the substantia nigra, cell death is observed when uh, you have Parkinson's disease. So uh, that's why our model is focusing on Parkinson, because we have this expert working on the midbrain region of the brain very specifically in our project. Of course, it's a good demonstrator. So um, having said that, so neurodegenerative disease modeling in vitro. When we say, um, obviously, the option number one is you can take animals and take the brains out of the animals and take the cells out of the animal's brain and then reassemble them, for example, on a mere plate, on microelectrode arrays, but uh, uh, study in great details how this would connect. And then you're stuck with a model from animal cells. And these animal cells are not reflecting to its completeness what's going on in the human cells. And maybe this is one aspect why, why we are not particularly successful in the development of neuro uh, pharmaceutical compounds for neurodegenerative diseases. So, but this is definitely a good option and it's, it's uh, heavily uh, investigated and I would not say stop doing that, but it's, it's you know, it's limited, it's animal cells and the genetics is slightly different. And uh, also it does not offer in this two dimensional format, any specific hierarchy or a specific organization. Then to maintain organization, it will not surprise you, you can use the animal itself, also mainly rodents. But also there, uh, I just have to stress that there are very, very few drugs being developed actually to, uh, to treat neurodegenerative diseases. So yes, they are in the pipeline, but most of them just fail when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, the, the patient studies. So in the clinical phase, most of this uh, uh, drug developments in the pipeline are failing, and that's mainly uh, summarized as being a mismatch between animal models and actually the human being and the brain of a human being. So new models. So here we are, new models. So what can you do? So uh, I already said that we, we, we can study the cells in the dish uh, in 2D formats. And uh, we may also uh, say we don't have to dissociate the cells from the animal brains we could maybe use slices. We could also maybe use a slices from human brain. But there, another element comes into play that when we get human brain specimens, most of the time they are either at age, uh, died for the natural cause, or maybe um, they had a disease. And so, in that, to actually compare and to have good controls about healthy state of brain tissue versus uh, diseased state of brain tissue. When you want to study what is going wrong, you need a very good control too. So what can we do? What can we do? And uh, that is really an exciting field. I'm not an expert on at all. So we can do actually human stem cell technology, right? So uh, within the uh, uh, change of the millennium, I think uh, we, we discovered many kind of uh, discussions around stem cell technology. And of course, we don't want to use embryonic stem cells. Uh, that is the ethical debate. So what we want to do is use adult stem cells, stem cells from an adult source. And that's what we can do today. Um, the medical field has really uh, advanced tremendously. And they even brought about these uh, very beautiful mini brains in a dish, like this uh, example by Lancaster Lab. And there you see the organization and you see the compartments uh, between different regions. And yes, it is looking very much like you make a cross section through real brain tissue. You also see that in these mini brains um, cultured purely by self assembly and, 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 and a lot of cell patterning techniques uh, involving growth factors and timing of adding this growth factor to the solution. So beautiful development, but here you're still stuck with the complexity. So to retrieve the information you're after in understanding disease mechanisms, you still have to sort of yeah, either take this whole uh, construct of about a half a millimeter to maybe two millimeters in size, 
in a sort of yeah, assemble it maybe also on a microelectrode array. But if you have this uh, volume type uh, construct, biological construct, and you press that onto the via plate, you can do it, you get some recordings, but you don't understand what's really going on inside. And, and yes, then you can sort of make slices again, which is very uh, laborious and uh, time consuming, and of course also expensive. So in that sense, it's great development that we have this mini brains, and I think we should really find good solution to combine mini brain development with the recent advances that my lab can offer on micro and nanofabrication methods. And, and, and microfluidics, of course. So to up convert the information retrieval rate from these very beautiful uh, cellular three-dimensional constructs. And as Enrique mentioned, we can use the microelectrode arrays and we can put cells uh, to form new networks on top of these from dissociated uh, uh, cell sources. And, and then we have a little carpet of uh, cells. But that is uh, something which is very much, you know, appreciated that we learn already about action potential synaptic uh, transmission. We, we really learned a lot from this type of two-dimensional cell culture formats on, uh, on MIRS. But uh, we want to go a step further. We really want to develop um, the compartmentalized uh, organization. We want to have the three-dimensional structure of how we see uh, the organization in the brain, because we think this adds to the network functionality of those cultured uh, cellular structures. And I just want to add here uh, from another group, from Bang uh, et al., actually a publication showing that there's a lot of effort going into combining microfluidic structures with the idea to actually also culture multiple types of cells to vascularize those type of grown tissues and in that sense create more complex informative structures but this is actually quite a quite a, yeah how should i say complicated uh, exercise and setup multiple cell types different types of uh, media being used uh, different types of uh, needs on growth factors and it's not an easy way forward so yes um, when you are strictly compartmentalized with microfluidics you make a good step forward but we are not quite there so yes we are uh, saying that this is a very good concept, three-dimensionality, including vascularization. But in these particular constructs, also to integrate then sensors and actuators, which help us to retrieve that information at a rate that is really advancing the field of medical technology and defining new um, uh, new targets, drug targets in neurodegenerative diseases, it's still uh, far from uh, that opportunity because uh, we are still in that uh, construct with, um, with a bit of microfluidics and cells which are uh, running um, their own life in that sense. And all this mechanics in there is giving cues to the cells to develop in fashion that might not resemble what the network structure is in the brain. So we have to take a step back. And uh, another concept, which uh, is also very old now, is the lab on a tip concept. And my lab actually uh, decided to take this step back and, 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 and look into lab on a chip microfluidics being a platform which can emulate, it mimics the function of the vascular. So we take one part of the complexity out of the system to allow for a faster turnaround, for allowing to have easier readouts, high throughput, easy accessible readouts. So if you take the vascular out of the equation, you can make life a little bit easier. And, and, and of course, uh, these lab on a chip devices have amazed us in the past with the uh, um, in probing and investigating circulating cells, circulating tumor cells, for example, in, uh, in physiological uh, uh, media, in conditions which you also find in physi physiological vascular system environments. So the microfluidics is particular prone to actually 
mimic the vascular system, so why not use it to our advantage? And the length scales of microfluidics devices is very much fit for actually taking those cells, housing cell cultures, as Enrico also uh, mentioned in his introduction. So it, with that said, um, having the right length scales, but also talking miniaturization to have the opportunity to take benefits of using small scale devices in saving resources. And by saving resources, so we're talking about uh, having a um, uh, microliter sized uh, cell culture environments using far less media, far less growth factor, far less uh, any uh, uh, stimulating, uh, drug stimulating um, components. And simply by that, using less, being cheaper. Right, so taking really advantage of that step, and with microfluidics, with lab on a chip concepts, we can take advantage still of having a very good control about our experiment. So we can control the pressure, we can control uh, the shear forces, we can control uh, the type of uh, compartmentalized uh, uh, organization of our structure. We know which component of our system is at which reservoir. So we really can fine tune and build then very good controls on the healthy cells versus the disease cells. And by integrating readouts by sensors and actuators, so stimulating actuators or uh, 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 sensing electrodes at a specific location within the three dimensional structure uh, in a label free manner will eventually uh, also upgrade uh, information retrieval and be a much faster route towards um, development of new therapeutic modalities. So, how can we probe? Um, how can we probe a single neuron's function within the complexity networks of uh, yeah, of, of of the nervous system structure and yet find drug targets efficiently? Let me um, once more go back to. Uh, to the 2D format of the microelectrode arrays. Because here we say it's 2D, but the reader technique being also 2D, maybe not you know, that bad. So we can use it already, this commercial available devices, the efforts being put into the beautiful development uh, on microelectrode arrays is not lost. We can still use that, but then need a solution to culture 3D tissues on top of this, um, uh, multi electrode arrays. And, and this was a uh, uh, first uh, um, exploration of saying, okay, so how, how do the cells, the, the cells we use as a model, look in, in 2D uh, formats? And my postdoc, uh, Jean Philippe Primat, uh, he compared that to actually when we are adding exoskeletal matrix materials. So we are adding commercial exoskeletal matrix materials hydrogels to our cultures to support cell adhesion and spatial organization in 3D. And when we do that, we receive with the same cell model, really nicely sphered structures of, uh, of the neuronal cell model, as well as uh, seeing the uh, outgrowth uh, in all uh, uh, three dimensions spatially distributed as in this image. And I was uh, very happy, of course, to, uh, to say, okay, we managed to do that. Now we have a plate, we have hydrogels, and we can do uh, three-dimensional cultures. But how do we do that? Actually, if you just add a little bit of hydrogel on a mere plate, and you would start uh, adding solutions, then these cells will see the shear forces again, and actually the hydrogel will start degrading. So we need a little device, and that's where the microfluidics comes back. And here you have a microfluidic, um, uh, so-called microbioreactor add-on for the uh, multi-electrode arrays. And uh, the red in red, uh, it's shown actually a uh, flow channel. So that's the feed uh, channel, so we can uh, exchange the media. And in this green part, that is the actual cell culture reservoir just also to, uh, to give you a glimpse on the dimensions. So we're talking here about three millimeter in diameter, maybe the total diameter is something like, uh, like 15 or uh, 17 millimeters. So this is a PDMS device, a polydimethylsilexane, um, gas permeable, 
polymer, soft polymer. But then how do we separate this flow channel from the cell culture? Uh, we need a growth barrier, so otherwise, of course, cells would just go and, and travel into this uh, uh, mimic of the vascular. So we made a growth barrier. In our original design, we used a, a double replication uh, technique to introduce agarose as a growth barrier between these two chambers, between the encircling channel and, and the uh, cell culture, it, which worked okay, but we were not yet successful to sustain long-term cultures. So we were failing in, in getting recordings from this microbiorectors at the time, but we worked um, uh, on an upgrade of this design. But uh, let me just briefly give the glimpse, like when you mount this onto a mirror, we uh, had the format of this three, three millimeter inner diameter of this uh, cell culture reservoir matching the footprint of the active electrodes on the mirror. And then uh, we replaced the agarose, the growth barrier, by uh, another porous uh, barrier. But actually, this is a, a polyethyl sulfon a membrane, which is also a membrane material being used in water filtration. And that very much uh, helped us to uh, create a robust microfluidic structure and a perfusion chamber where we had uh, the PDMS uh, gasket also done by replication techniques from a simple PMA micromilled uh, mold. And uh, we inserted here these needles as an extension for uh, making access holes. And then uh, if you uh, fill it with PDMS, um, and then uh, once the PDMS is hardened, uh, you can pull out these needles, you have the access holes, which you also see here. Yes. And then uh, we inserted a little polyethyl phone membrane uh, just in this inner part, in a press fit into this PDMS. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple, straightforward um, assembly technique to, to, uh, to have a sustainable long-term culture. And with that, on near, uh, and actually introducing not our uh, neuronal model cell, SHSY5, Y neuroblastoma cell, which is actually a, a cancerous cell line, um, which is non-electrical active, but shows synaptic development. We had to change to an electroactive uh, cell, and we found a cell source for that uh, at Axel Biosciences, a UK-based company. They are uh, delivering this service that you can order uh, human uh, adult stem cells in different stages of the development. We chose to, because, well, we are, a lab in mechanical engineering department, so uh, we are a little bit uh, uh, naive when it comes to biological experiments. So we start already later in the uh, differentiation state of those cells, uh, which is called the neuroprogenitor state. And then these stem cells are already driven to become a neuron. So we already um, pre-described the state of the cell once we start uh, differentiating by um, I, uh, the, the, the factors to actually start uh, neural process development. So we introduced that type of cell in our lab and uh, uh, characterized it and, and showed that we have actually neuron-like features. And with this uh, cell cultures in the microbiorector, we took our first readings in 2018, actually. Um, and, and that was really important because this is the basis, this really put now the foundation for the CONNECT project, which had started in, which we submitted in 2018 and then started in 2019, based on this success of taking readings in three-dimensional microfluidic uh, cultures on MIA, shows that over time, you see seven days in culture, 14 days in culture, 21 days in culture, that over time, the network matures and produces more and more signals. I will leave it to the experts if this is a healthy state or maybe an elliptiform uh, sort of uh, discharge of, um, of the uh, dual network activity. But uh, we were very happy to see this. And uh, we can run in this type of format, uh, in this microbiorector, microfluidic format, uh, cultures uh, over several months. So that's very important because you need to mature uh, stem cells to a certain state 
in development and it takes uh, at least uh, 50 days to have a mixed cell culture of supporting glial cells and neurons. And that's what you need to, amend, to again, to mimic the spatial organization of the, of, of the brain tissue as it is found in people. So you need a mixed uh, cell source. And if that uh, cell source develops self-organized from the stem cell genetics, then of course that's the ideal starting point for making better, better controlled models. So having said that, um, obviously we were hit by um, COVID-19 and also our lab suffered from being closed for several months throughout the crisis. And I, I cannot share new results, new culture results uh, on this microbioreactor format. But what I would like to share is um, that we collected um, really a huge data set. So, so we have gigabytes of data on this uh, one, uh, one microbioreactor experiment. And we see clearly that uh, from the onset of seven days in culture, uh, we, we see that sp sp spiking action potentials are, uh, are measured on the uh, two-dimensional multi electrode array, and that this uh, spiking rate increases over time. But then there's also a change. But now we have a transition from cells being 2D going into 3D. So we have fewer cells connected with electrodes. But then still climbing up network activity. So these, these spiking rates are transduced from the three-dimensional network to the two-dimensional readout plane of the electrodes. And uh, without going into detail of, uh, of this very uh, specific uh, burst rates and network burst rates, uh, which are all uh, um, indicative for the maturation of these networks in 3D, um, I just want to highlight that we are uh, we are presenting this also uh, very soon on a conference, um, actually first 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 week of June, and follow up a paper. So please uh, go and visit our papers, uh, which are coming out of this uh, um, specific uh, data analysis technique, and to really learn about network functions. Let me switch gears for just the uh, final bit of uh, of the presentation to the microfluidics, uh, again, being used in gentle cell seeding. We can use capillary forces between a plate uh, and a petri dish to actually gently uh, suck uh, cells onto our platform. And I want to go back to this beautiful image I showed at the very beginning. Now, we have captured a single cell within a pocket, which we use a micro sieve for. And having worked out on this capillary pumping, we, uh, we managed to show that Yes, uh, not in the electrical domain yet, but in the optical domain, that these uh, networks seated on the sieves are actually functionally active. Um, I don't go into details now about the software we are using to read out the uh, calcium uh, intensity peaks, which are uh, stimulated by adding a specific uh, dye to this culture. But they are indicative for uh, the electrophysiology uh, within these uh, cells. and. Uh, uh, having realized this type of combined three-dimensional culture reservoirs with uh, three-dimensional readout capabilities allows us now to do the next step of development also in the Connect project. I mentioned we started on silicon technology. Silicon is a very hard, brittle material, actually cells like softer materials, polymers. So we, we also wanted to have a disposable device, a, a cheaper device, so we translated that into a, a a replicated uh, polymer, we found an optical adhesive, so called NOAA 81, to do the job. But uh, in our uh, lab to make these devices for uh, proof of concept, we used an excimer laser to open these pores. And it's a little bit tedious, so we just, uh, just opened 100 of these holes uh, instead of 900 in the original design. And now you can combine this micro seeds also maybe with microbioreactor, PDMS type of uh, gaskets, or uh, add. Uh, uh, helping tools, features to it, like this PMMA ring. I should show this as a PMMA ring and helps to grab it with a tweezer here. And this flimsy part underneath, that is actually our micro C foil made from this NOAA 81. And uh, having said that, um, we are now having this platform. We have this micro C, we can capture cells, a single cell, 
compared to a certain reader position, uh, we actually also started a company um, to uh, to explore the commercial uh, opportunity of this uh, type of devices. Secondly, and uh, we have that uh, capture uh, capability. Now we can add three-dimensional structures. And how we want to do that is uh, very much defined by the different work packages of our Connect project. So let me briefly go through here. Uh, I mentioned already University of Luxembourg. They developed the mid-brain organoids. Uh, we developed the microfluidics. Um, Alt University is electrochemical, uh, electrochemical sensing. Uh, materials expert and uh, integration of those materials. Then Sheffield works on the enteric neurons uh, and differentiation of enteric, uh, 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 enteric neurons from stem cells. And uh, Erasmus is then uh, coming later into the project for the uh, pathophysiological characterization of our uh, structures. And Kay Leuven is microscopy expert and also on the pathology of those enteric nervous system cells. Uh, and together we are testing our platform and our platform is um, a three compartments platform, microfluid platform. And it has the main purpose to actually show that instrumentally you can stretch out axons and axon growth between midbrain organoids and enteric nervous system cells and follow molecular tran transport in these regions of interest um, by, by optical techniques or maybe uh, electrically integrated techniques. So, but it's very much on the uh, um, showing the, the system requirements and show that we get uh, these two very distinguished uh, essential nervous system paths, midbrain connected with, uh, with the enteric uh, nervous system cells. So we use midbrain organoids and enteric nervous system cells to, uh, to confine microfluidically connected compartments and apply cues in the chip to allow for enhanced differentiation and uh, uh, specify regions of interest for effective data harvesting in our project. And now let me just briefly um, uh, go through um, uh, the developments at our partner site. So, for example, the Erasmus Medical Center, Professor Stephen Kushner and uh, Dr. Fry, they have shown that when you uh, have a three millimeter uh, diameter well, you get in stem cell technology, uh, the layer structure of the cortex. And it's very much size dependent. And we take this as a design um, parameter in our, uh, into our new Connect platform. Then uh, we have the midbrains, and we can have the midbrains directly connecting with transducer cells in our regard systems. We could also, of course, have dissociated cells assembling again in soft scaffolds in, in hydrogels to create this three-dimensional structure. And, uh, and when we have the midbrains, we actually shown that uh, in the Schombon lab that these midbrains are forming radial outgrowths. And this radial axon outgrowths, that is then translated into our microfluid chip platform, and we would insert the midbrain into a central reservoir connecting with microtunnels to the reservoirs uh, containing enteric neurons system cells, we can actually have a retail system which allows us uh, different uh, lengths being explored. So we could punch uh, reservoirs at different uh, distance from the central reservoir, but we could also, of course, punch them out in a way that they are all the same lengths. That very much depends on the experiments you want to do. We tested this little platform, this very first Connect chip, uh, developed by my PhD student, uh, Raman Sabai Kaviani. Um, and, and we tested that with the uh, neuroblastoma sushi cell uh, culture, again, for uh, functional performance. And we, we see that cells are going into these tunnels, forming also very long outgrowths. And um, we can also assemble this with additional nanocues for functional enhancement. I don't want to go into details of how this is uh, produced or read out. Please do visit our papers about this or ask later in the Q&A. Uh, but nanogroups do enhance uh, differentiation features. And uh, combining those uh, chip systems, chip platforms, will allow us to go through developing further the very detailed um, organizational structures and specific regions of interest. So um, Sheffield uh, showed that they're very, very well on their uh, culture protocol for uh, differentiating enteric neural system cells from stem cells. And uh, uh, 
Theo Leuven showed us that they can actually also optically label free using second harmonics uh, visualize microtubules in, in, in those enteric neural system cells cultures, which we have developed in our project. And uh, Alto is very well on their way to uh, implement electrochemical sensors, for example, to measure dopamine. And uh, having uh, reached these, uh, these, these, these combination, this assemblage of different techniques, very multidisciplinary uh, knowledge collection within our, uh, with our Connect project now, we can define the regions of interest where we want to observe the uh, uh, change in mechanisms, biological mechanisms, healthy again versus disease. And uh, uh, in summary, then we have this functional readouts uh, taking advantage of the commercial developments of multi-electrode arrays or actually integrating those electrodes also within our novel platforms, for example, the microsieve. We can uh, fine-tune differentiation processes and uh, network configuration by nanogroups. And uh, uh, we have a very good diffusion by uh, implementing microfluidics formats like the microbioreactor. But this has to come together into one project. And I'm very happy and, of course, very grateful once for, uh, for the funding which we received from the Horizon 2020 program. With that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for this wonderful group. Only the ones are grateful for the stuff you're doing. And it's amazing how you're going from the old 2D version to 3D, adding this potential for microfluidic enable vasculature emulation. It's getting so close to the actual thing. So thanks so much for the presentation, but also for all the work uh, the team uh, under your leadership is doing. We, we have a few uh, questions. Um, um, okay, so the first one was about um, similar projects uh, on our portfolio. I can probably contribute uh, to this one. Uh, we have um, uh, a search tool called Cordis, C-O-R-D-I-S. So if anyone in the audience wants to just uh, uh, pull up some information on this project or other projects, you can go to Cordis and then look up sort of keywords like brain, neuron, lab on achieve, and you will come up with this project and other projects and you can sort of uh, get to their website and read more about them. Um, what kind of materials? There's a question of materials. Which materials do you, I think you mentioned a few like silicon, PDMS. What materials do you use? Yeah, so we are aiming for uh, implementation of soft materials, but with the accuracy that we know from, from using silicon, right? Silicon micromachining. But um, the main material we use is still PDMS for gases, for microfluidic structures, for cell cultures, because of the permeability, gas permeability of the PDMS, which is, uh, which is very good when you put the device in the incubator. Um, but also for the young spoilers. So uh, PDMS is still our material of choice. But then it's combined with the hydrogels, right? So the three-dimensional structure is, is um, uh, created by implementing hydrogels within these microfluidic structures. Yes. Um, thank you. There is another question on um, the use of your technology for other diseases um, beyond Parkinson's. Yeah, so I mentioned uh, that Parkinson is, is, is our model to, to show a demonstrator, uh, which is a very important demonstrator, of course, and we selected it because one of our partners is very much an expert on midbrains, right? Uh, but of course, once you show that you can connect two different parts of the nervous system, enteric and central brain, central, system, central uh, nervous system cells, if you can show that, then you can think about any other kind of um, central nervous system cells being connected, right? So you could even have two brain regions being connected. Uh, that is not limited then. So you could think of, you know, where epilepsy, for example, is a network disease. So it would be very interesting to have two different uh, compartments showing different regions of the brain being connected on our chip for epilepsy modeling. Tremendously powerful. You can go to any circuit you like, and then with reprogramming, you can use a uh, human uh, neural cell, which is really impressive, very close to the real, yes. to the real teacher. Thanks for the answer. There's another question on manufacturing strategies. 
Um, maybe also, if you want to mention about the scalability, mm -hmm. how do you see the manufacturing aspect? Yeah. Yeah, obviously, obviously, in our proof of concept, we are still working uh, in an academic laboratory, so uh, it's it's always a little bit um, a difficult question to answer. But what we have in our design strategy is that we are taking upscaling into account in our design strategy. So I've mentioned several times that we use replication techniques, and replication techniques can be scaled. So uh, injection molding, for example, is a very well scalable technique. Uh, also, the dimensions are very much uh, uh, in line with those techniques already uh, offering mass production. Obviously, you want to draw from um, uh, our knowledge in microelectronics, right? And one really nice uh, way forward is to, in, to, to make and take advantage of large area display technology. So we are thinking that the dimension of the scale we are talking about, we need for this type of devices to come for repetition is, uh, is already given in large area display technology. And the only thing why, why we are not using it right now is because we don't have uh, uh, that process line, right? In our lab, that would be too expensive to set up this process line. But this translation from the techniques being used in the lab, in our lab, to uh, manufacture through large area displays is actually very small. So we have a way forward. Yes, thanks for the answer. There is another interesting question about, it's maybe a broader question. Uh, what do you see as the main challenge to be tackled. Uh, you already described a little bit you want the tissue to be closer to the real brain, manufacturing ability. You have, what's your vision for the future? What are the challenges ahead for you and your team and for the field? Yes. Um, it's well, a difficult to, one. to show, no, yes, it's a very difficult one. But to show that you really have the signature of the disease versus a good control structure, because some um, of my colleagues are currently very much comparing. 2D cultures, where they have lots of experience, how it should behave, to 3D culture. And I'm not in favor of that type of control because I think they're just total different networks. So different networks, different network behavior. And to prove that you have a disease signature in your, uh, in your model, right, you have to compare it with the clinical uh, observation. So you need to study and translate, uh, for example, an EEG signal and translate this EEG signals to the signals and, and, and uh, align them with the signals you find in your model. And then the electrical techniques are really great here because they are one-on-one -on -one comparable. But that will be our next real big challenge to show that we have these type of disease signatures in our model. That's, a, that's very interesting. I remember once uh, talking to pharma industry uh, and they said exactly what you said. They, they actually look at our cultures and they said, oh, this is much closer to reality. But now I don't exactly know what to look at because it's so complicated. So finding the signature that really tells you about the, the disease you're looking for, this is really critical. Thanks for that clarification. And I'm, I'm reaching the end of the list. I have to jump ahead because I think timing is very tight. There's a very question, it's a very interesting one. Somebody wants to read your papers, so maybe we could suggest to go into your website, I suppose, at uh, Technical University of Eindhoven, and maybe find the references there, and yes. we can go from those references. Absolutely, yeah, or send me an email, and it's very, uh, if you type in Regina Lutke, you find me. <laughs> thank you so much for that. So I'm getting to the end of the questions. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your talk, your presentation, and thanks again for all your work. Um, You're welcome. It's very relevant in the field. And I think my, my colleagues want to maybe step in and, and talk about the next events. Thank you so much again. Uh, You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much you. for having me. Thanks. Thank you so much to, to both of you for the very interesting uh, presentation and the topic that was touched on today. Uh, I would like to, to remind everyone that uh, from 21st of June until 2nd of July, we have a special sixth edition of Summer School uh, that uh, aims to, to share knowledge on the way climate change is uh, interconnected with the digital uh, transformation. Uh, and uh, here we'll, uh, we'll have uh, experts uh, coming from uh, EU institutions in the Three academia presenting you cutting edge uh, 
innovations uh, addressing how uh, digital technologies can be used to to actually tackle uh, climate change. So you can find all this information on our Connect University webpage on Futurium. So stay tuned for for the future events, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.